Okay, we're going to start a new chapter today. This is chapter 17 and it's on reaction kinetics. Kinetics is another term for the rate of a reaction. Now we're actually going to skip the first part of the chapter and we're going to jump right into some factors that affect the rate of a reaction or how fast a reaction proceeds. Some chemical reactions occur instantaneously. Other chemical reactions occur over time. Some reactions take years to proceed. And so we're going to discuss in this chapter uh, factors, to begin with, factors that affect the rate of a reaction. So, first of all, let's think of the nature of the reactants. Um, the lab that we did not too long ago where we took ions in solution and we mixed them together, you notice those ionic compounds formed almost instantaneously. Do you recall when a precipitate formed? So reactions between ions are very fast. So between ions, that's a very fast rate. However, oftentimes reactions between molecules are not often as fast. Now they can be pretty fast, but they're not as fast as the reaction between ions and the formation of a precipitate. That goes very, very quickly. Molecules tend to react more slowly. Letter B, we're going to spend a lot of time on this later on in this video, the concentration of the reactants. Now, as you can imagine, as the reacting concentration increases, there's probably a greater likelihood of them colliding with each other in the proper orientation and with enough energy. Therefore, we would expect the rate to increase. Temperature. Temperature plays a big role in the rate of a reaction. An increase in temperature will always increase the rate of a reaction. Now think about this. In order for a reaction to occur, two molecules need to hit each other in the proper orientation with the proper energy. If the temperature is increasing, the particles are moving around faster. Therefore, they're hitting each other more often, and they're hitting with each other with more energy, thus increasing the likelihood of an appropriate collision occurring and a reaction occurring. So, let's talk a little bit about activation energy before we go further. Activation energy is the energy that we need to put into a reaction to reach what's called the activated complex. Let's take an example of a hot wheel um, going up a hill and down a hot wheel track. You can push this hot wheel car and it might not have enough energy to get to the top of the hill and it just rolls back. However, if you push it just the right amount, not only does it get barely to the top, but it has enough energy to fall down to the bottom. In this case, it'll release more energy um, than it gained in uh, achieving its activation energy. And when that occurs, we call that an exothermic reaction. But the activation energy is the energy required to get to the top of this hill. The energy required to form the activated complex. So in my graph, it's at the top of this curve, the top of the hill, just the moment before it goes down. If it doesn't have enough energy to get to the very top and to make itself fall down, then it'll fall back down the other direction and it won't react. So that's what activation energy is. And of course, increasing the temperature increases the speed of that car. It has more energy. It's greater to overcome the, it's more likely to overcome the activation energy. Let's take a look at an endothermic and end exothermic graph here. This is an endothermic reaction. We just saw an exothermic a second ago. And so here we have a greater activation energy than the energy we get out in forming my products. So this is an endothermic reaction. So if the activation energy is higher the energy, than the energy we get out in forming the products, we call that endothermic. The one before the activation energy was not as great as we got out in forming the product. So that's an exothermic reaction. Now, letter D is the use of a catalyst. Now, there's a demo. 
uh, on our YouTube channel called Decomposition of H2O2. Take a look at that demo and that will help illustrate the role of a catalyst in a chemical reaction. For right now, let me just say that the catalyst decreases the activation energy of a reaction. So this is hydrogen peroxide. When it decomposes, it decomposes into water and oxygen gas. The activation energy for this reaction is quite high. As a result, this reaction proceeds very, very slowly. However, if I add a catalyst to the reaction, it provides an alternate pathway for the reaction to proceed, a different mechanism. And the activation energy is lower, so it's easier to overcome to form my products. Now notice the delta H of my reaction, the distance between my products and reactants doesn't change, but the activation energy does. So more of these molecules have the required energy to get over that hill. Once again, imagine, imagine Hot Wheels, if you would. Hot Wheels, to get over this big hill, would take quite a bit of energy. But to get over this smaller hill, it's easier to get them over. So more of these molecules would be able to turn into products. And as a result, the reaction proceeds faster with a catalyst. Surface area. Um, surface area usually deals with solids. And as we grind up or pulverize our solids, we take large uh, particles and turn them into very small particles. So the uh, surface area that's allowed to react increases dramatically. So when we think about surface area, think about sawdust. If I took one pound of sawdust and throw it, throw it in a fire, that would burn much faster than one pound of lumber. When I put one pound of lumber in the fire, the oxygen that needs to react with the, with the wood um, can only contact the outside of that piece of lumber. Can't get at the inside quite yet. But when I grind it up and turn it into sawdust, there are more wood particles exposed to the oxygen, and therefore the rate will increase. So for surface area, think about sawdust. Letter F applies only to gases, and that's an increase in pressure. As I increase the pressure, the pressure on gases, I push the molecules closer together. There's a greater concentration of particles per unit volume. And since there's a greater concentration, there's a greater likelihood that they're going to bump into each other and therefore react. Now that only applies to gases. If I increase the pressure over liquids or solids, that's not going to affect the rate at all. So for gases, this is the same as the concentration concept from part B. That was back here. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Okay? All right. Now, here we are. Now we're going to talk about the effect that concentration has on the rate of a reaction. So before we start a quick algebra lesson, let's say I have B reacting to form A. And let's say that A is proportional to B to the zero power. Now think about this mathematically. Anything to the zero power is 1, isn't it? So if I double the amount of B, so let's say instead of being 1 to the 0 power, this is 2 to the 0 power. What effect does that have on A? Well, let's see. When it was 1 to the 0 power, A was equal to 1. When it was 2 to the 0 power, A was equal to 1. I don't know. When it's 3 to the 0 power, A was equal to 1. Doubling B will make the amount of A, hmm, not change. How about tripling the amount of B? Well, I don't know. 1 to the 0 power, 2 to the 0 power, 3 to the 0 power will make the amount of A not change. So when I have A is proportional to B to the 0 power, no matter what I do to B, it will not have an effect on the value of A. However, if, that's, if it is A is proportional to B to the first power, let's think about this. Doubling B will do what to A? Well, let's see, if b was equal to 1, 1 to the first power is 1. If I double b and make it 2, 2 to the first power is 2. Hmm, doubling b doubled a. What if I triple b? 3 to the first power is 3. So doubling b doubled a, tripling b tripled a. Hmm, whatever I do to a, that's what happens, or excuse me, whatever I do to b, that's what happens to a. So doubling b will 
double A. And tripling B will triple A. Hmm. So whatever I do to B, it has the same effect on A. We call that a direct proportionality. And finally, what if A is proportional to B squared? Huh. Let's see, if B is equal to 1, 1 squared is 1. Okay, let's double B. Now B is equal to 2. 2 squared is 4. Hmm. So by doubling B, I quadrupled A. If I triple B, 3 squared is 9. So tripling B, oh, I don't know, 9 tuples A? We'll make up a word there. So whatever I do to B, I square it, and that's what its effect will be on A. So doubling B will quadruple A, and tripling B will, will let's make up a, a word here, will nine tuple A. So whatever I do to B, I square it, and that's what effect it will have on A. Remember, this proportionality sign can be replaced with an equal sign so long as we add a proportionality constant k into the mix. Okay? All right, let me back up just a bit. Okay. Now, for every chemical reaction, the relationship between the rate of the reaction and the concentration of the reactants is called rate law. Rate laws can be expressed as follows. If I have a reaction where A and B react to form compound D, the rate of the reaction is proportional to, or equals, K times the concentration of A to some power, M, and B to some power, N. So the rate is related to the concentration of my reactants to some power, M and N. Now, by the way, those powers will be either 0, 1, or 2. That's why we had that math lesson just a moment ago. So A and B are the initial concentration of my reactants A and B. M and N, the exponents, must be determined experimentally. M is the order of the reaction with respect to A, and N will be the order of the reaction with respect to B. They will be the exponents for A and B. Once again, they need to be determined experimentally. Sometimes you'll be asked to find the over, o, overall order of the reaction, and that's simply the sum of the two exponents, m and n. Now, the best way to explain this is simply by giving an example. So let's take a look at this example here. We have hydrogen and nitrogen oxide producing water vapor and nitrogen gas, and I conduct seven experiments. In those experiments, you can see I'm changing the concentration of NO, and I'm changing the concentration of H2. And, as you would expect, the rate changes. Now, from this data, we are going to determine the values of M and N, and hence what's called the rate law for this reaction. So let's take a look at our first two experiments. Do you notice that the NO concentration does not change? But the H2 concentration doubles. What does the rate do? Hmm. The rate also doubles. Why did the rate double? Was it because of anything I did to NO? No, that stayed constant. Was it because of what I did to H2? Hmm. Yeah, the H2 doubled and the rate doubled. Huh. Isn't that that direct proportionality that we talked about a moment ago? Where the order would be 1? So, the order of this reaction with respect to H2, and I like to write it like this, is first order, or to the first power. Think back to our math lesson. When B was to the first power, whatever I did to it, the same thing happened to A. So let's take a look at our experimental data now. Let's see if I can find the right page for us. Here we go. Whatever I did to H2, the same thing happened to the rate. Here, let's try another one. What if I tripled H2? So 1 to 3, while well, the NL was constant. Well, the rate tripled. Once again, proving that the order of the reaction with respect to H2 is first order. Now, what am I going to look at to find out the order of the reaction with respect to the NO? Which experiments can I use? Well, the NO doesn't change in the first three experiments. Hmm. But it doubles in experiments 4 and 5, where H2 now remains constant. So now H2 is constant during these experiments. But NO doubles between 4 and 5. 
What does the rate do? 3 to 12. Hey, that's quadrupling, isn't it? So when NO doubled and H2 was held constant, the rate quadrupled. What type of relationship is that? What order is that? Is it zero, first, or second? Well, remember, a zero order was when I doubled or tripled this, it had no effect on this. First order, when I doubled this, this would double. That's not what happened. Second order, though, if I doubled this, I square that, it would four-tuple my rate. So I claim the order with respect to NO is second order. Here, let's take a look at a couple more experiments. Let's look at between 4 and 6. Here, I'm going from 1 to 3. I'm tripling the NO while H2 is constant. And the rate goes up 9 times. So the concentration was tripled, the rate 9 tupled. Once again, telling us that the NO is second order. So now we can rate what, write what's called a rate law. So the rate law for this reaction is R equals K, that's how they always begin, times the concentration of H2 to the first power and NO to the second power. And now we can calculate the value of K, which is called my rate law constant. K would be equal to, we have to do some Algebra 1 here, R over H2 to the first and NO to the second. So we have to find an experiment that we know the rate and the concentration of H2 and NO. I happen to like to use the first experiments when I do these problems.